Let's ask the Lord's blessing. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for your great kindness and your mercies that have kept us to this very day. And we thank you for the great privileges that we enjoy as the people of God and that even now today we can draw near to the throne of grace in heaven and that we can come united by our living head and through your gracious Holy Spirit with all the people of God as they are today scattered across the world all uniting around the throne in heaven and with the spirits of just men made perfect and with all the holy angels to worship and adore your name. We thank you for this perspective that you teach us to look away from and above and beyond the narrow horizons of this world with all it has to offer and to see that our greater treasure is there in glory. Help us today then with heart and mind all that we have and all that we are, to worship you, to adore your name, and to rejoice in your goodness and grace. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Let's join together in reading Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Psalm of David when he pretended madness before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. Psalm 34. Shall we stand? I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Amen. Our reading this morning is from the Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 15, and from the Gospel of Luke, and chapter 20. Numbers 15 and Luke 20. In Numbers 15, we'll begin reading from verse 22. Let's hear the word of God. If you sin unintentionally and do not observe all these commandments which the Lord has spoken to Moses, all that the Lord has commanded you by the hand of Moses from the day the Lord gave commandment and onward throughout your generations, then it will be, if it is unintentionally committed, without the knowledge of the congregation, that the whole congregation shall offer one young bull as a burnt offering, as a sweet aroma to the Lord, with its grain offering and its drink offering according to the ordinance, and one kid of the goats as a sin offering. 
So the priest shall make atonement for the whole congregation of the children of Israel, and it shall be forgiven them, for it was unintentional. They shall bring their offering, an offering made by fire to the Lord, and their sin offering before the Lord for their unintended sin. It shall be forgiven the whole congregation of the children of Israel and the stranger who dwells among them, because all the people did it unintentionally. And if a person sins unintentionally, then he shall bring a female goat in its first year as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for the person who sins unintentionally when he sins unintentionally before the Lord to make atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. You shall have one law for him who sins unintentionally, for him who is native-born among the children of Israel, and for the stranger who dwells among them. But the person who does anything presumptuously, whether he is native-born or a stranger, that one brings reproach on the Lord, and he shall be cut off from among his people, because he has despised the word of the Lord, and has broken his commandment. That person shall be completely cut off, his guilt shall be upon him. Now while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him under guard because it had not been explained what should be done to him. Then the Lord said to Moses, This man must surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. So as the Lord commanded Moses, all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died. And then from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 20, and from verse 1. Now it happened on one of those days, as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, that the chief priests and scribes, together with the elders, confronted him and spoke to him, saying, Tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who is he who gave you this authority? But he answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing, and answer me. The baptism of John. Was it from heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, all the people will stone us, for they are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it was from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Then he began to tell the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard, leased it to vine dressers, and went into a far country for a long time. Now at vintage time he sent a servant to the vine dressers that they might give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the vine dressers beat him, sent him away empty handed. Again he sent another servant, and they beat him also treated him shamefully, and sent him away empty-handed. And again he sent a third, and they wounded him also, and cast him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Probably they will respect him when they see him. But when the vine dressers saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, Certainly not. Then he looked at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. And the chief priests and the scribes that very hour sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken this parable 
against him. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous, that they might seize on his words in order to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor. Then they asked him, saying, Teacher, we know that you say and teach rightly, and you do not show personal favoritism, but teach the truth of the way of God in truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, Why do you test me? Show me a denarius. Whose image and inscription does it have? They answered and said, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. But they could not catch him in his words in the presence of the people, and they marvelled at his answer and kept silence. May the Lord bless his word to us. Let's come now to God in prayer. Let us all pray. Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, we may approach you through our mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest over the house of God. We thank you that he is so perfectly suited to be our saviour and our high priest, touched with the feelings of our infirmities, having taken our nature to himself. We thank you that he has been tested in all points as we are. And as we see him portrayed in Holy Scripture, we see him suffering exhaustion to the point of sleep in the midst of a storm. We see him suffering betrayal at the hands of enemies, at the hands of friends. We see him in every point uh, meeting with stress and distress such as we uh, experience in our lives. And we know then that he's able to come to our help to sympathise with us. We thank you that with that sympathy, that ocean of sympathy that there is in his heart for people such as us, it is also connected with boundless, limitless grace, uh, the resources of power to come to our help and to lift us up when we are cast down. We bless you then for this great Saviour. We thank you for the glory of that great act of atonement that he has achieved in his death on the cross, whereby the shedding of his blood, he has covered and removed our sins. We thank you that he's able to give us a clean conscience as we stand before the throne of heaven, that there is no sin for which we must give account because he has paid the price and the penalty for that sin. And we may stand then as freeborn men before the throne of heaven, knowing ourselves to be sons and daughters of the living God, heirs of a glorious inheritance with our Saviour. We thank you then that uh, you look upon us in Christ and that uh, all of his glorious and spotless righteousness has been attributed to us, reckoned over to our account so that we may stand guiltless before the throne of heaven. We thank you for that grace. We thank you that you've been at work in our lives from our mother's arms, setting your love upon us, even from before the foundation of the world, and that that love has brought us irresistibly by your grace and power into your family and kingdom. We thank you that you've been wor working in us since, that you will perfect that work that you've begun in us, that there's a day of glory and a grace that lies before us, uh, when we will uh, forever be separated from our sins and sorrows, our suffering and sadness, and we will know only the joy and bliss of the people of God and conformity, perfect conformity, uh, to the moral beauty and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we look forward to that day with hope and with confidence that we will be brought there, not because, Lord, of our commitment and determination but because of your commitment and determination to be true to your purpose and promise and so our confidence is in you help us every day to be looking away from ourselves and our weakness and our frailty to the power and the grace and the love of God for us in Christ Jesus 
that we may live here confidently and with assurance of ultimately being brought safely home to glory. We thank you for the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the sanctifying influences of the Holy Spirit in us, moment by moment, day by day, keeping us in the midst of trials and difficulties and bringing us uh, to yourself. Do pray for your church today. Remember the people of God as they are scattered throughout this world, some, Lord, in the midst of the most terrible distresses. And uh, we pray for them that you'd be their help and their strength today. And for us today, in the more regular, normal, day-by-day uh, -day difficulties of life, uh, our, our lives in comparison to so many others of your people uh, have fallen in, into pleasant places. We thank you for it and we pray that, Lord, you'd not only keep us in our difficulties but keep us in our pleasures too. And the many things that cause us joy and comfort in this life, we pray that we would view them for what they are as passing pleasures uh, but that we would be laying up our treasures even today in heaven where moth and rust uh, does not corrupt, where thieves cannot break through and steal, that our treasure would be in heaven at your right hand where our Saviour is. So graciously work in us, uh, we pray. We ask for our nation uh, that you would, Lord, give wisdom and grace to those who lead and guide and direct the affairs of state and uh, care and protect uh, the people and we ask Lord for them for great wisdom in a day such as this and that they should be people of integrity and uprightness of heart. We do pray for our loved ones in their particular needs. We remember our brother Dave Morgan uh, that you'd be with him uh, today. We pray that he might soon be able to leave the hospital and have some help uh, with this uh, breathing difficulties that he's been having. Uh, for the family of uh, uh, Pat and Bob Lewington, some uh, now infected with COVID, that you'd uh, help them and preserve them through the illness. And for uh, the many others in our land today who are in hospital receiving uh, difficult treatments for this disease, we pray for them. We pray that our nation would soon, and not only us, but uh, the other nations of the world would soon be released from this uh, awful pandemic and disease. Lord, hear our prayers as we pray for the preaching of your word today throughout the world. We pray that you'd get glory to your name. We pray thy kingdom come. May it come through the preaching of your word and the power of your spirit in the lives of many people. Hear us for our own children and for our children's children that your saving mercy and grace uh, should be granted also to them that we would have the joy of hearing of household conversions as uh, our loved ones come to put their trust in the Saviour. Hear our prayers now we, we ask for those who are bereaved and uh, enduring times of sadness and loss. We pray Lord that you draw near to them to encourage them and lift their hearts. Be with the preachers of your word as they proclaim your word today. Help them Give them grace and strength. Help them to do all for your glory and be honoured in the preaching of your word as we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's turn now to God's word in uh, the book of Hebrews again. New Testament book of Hebrews in chapter 10. We'll read from verse 19 again. Therefore, brethren... Having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he, is, he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, 
there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days, in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with suffering. Partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Amen. Well, last Lord's Day we considered together that powerful threefold exhortation that comes to us in verses 22 through 24, and we saw that it's an exhortation concerning our duty toward God, and our duty uh, toward uh, the world, and our duty towards fellow believers, or we might say to the church, in light of the fact that that we, there is a new and a living way that has been opened up into the presence of God, he says, our duty is to draw near to God. And then in relation to the world, we are to hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Uh, that is, because of all that God has done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ and through the Son of his love, we are to boldly confess our hope uh, to a world that is full of despair. And then in relation to our fellow believers, in relation to the church, we are to consider, he says, how we might stir up one another to love and good works, and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, and, and so on, in light of the Lord's uh, glorious return. Then after that threefold appeal and exhortation, the writer brings another, a fourth of his warnings, uh, that is so characteristic of this New Testament uh, letter. Uh, one famous commentator actually refers to this as the epistle of warnings. And it's very interesting and instructive to notice how in this epistle there is this striking balance between encouragement for the people of God and exhortation on one hand and then warning on the other. Right the way through the epistle we find words of encouragement as we are urged to look to Jesus. For example, in chapter 12, he encourages them in, in chapter 11 with the example of believers through the generations living by faith throughout biblical history, exhorting them to go on to know the Lord and so on. And then, as we've seen in earlier chapters, there's all, also with that this element of warning. And it's important that we seek the Lord's help and enabling that we strive to, to sort of hit the same balance uh, in ministry today, both publicly and, and privately. How awful it would be if all we ever heard was warning. How terribly discouraging that would be to us. And we would soon be depressed if we were listening to warnings all the time, especially so when so many believing hearts, it seems to me, are just aching for some encouragement. God intends that each of us exercise a ministry of encouragement toward others, uh, uh, other believers. But we have to strive for a biblical balance. Sometimes it's easier 
uh, to bring an encouragement than it is to bring a warning. We might be afraid of the reaction if we are warning people about something. And so we might be tempted to neglect uh, bringing warning to people. There is, however, a sanctifying power in encouragement, without a doubt. A God-centered praise of someone is very different from flattery, which God abhors and which we ought to abhor too. But uh, proper encouragement, proper praise for people, which we find so often through the pages of the New Testament. Very often we find the Apostle Paul saying things like, I thank God every time I remember you. I remember this about you and I remember that about you and I thank God uh, for it and so on. Over and over again we see that sort of encouragement uh, given in the New Testament. And yet with it, alongside it, also words of admonishment and warning directed to God's people. And this epistle to the Hebrews is a clear example of that sort of biblical balance. And we see it here again from verse 26 of chapter 10. We have the fourth warning passage and it is a warning about willful, deliberate, persistent, conscious turning away from God, rejecting God rebelling against God. That's what the warning is about. That's the danger that he sees these Hebrew Christians as facing. They were under pressure. They are suffering because of their allegiance to the Lord Jesus. And they're in danger because of it of drifting away. And so he's urging them in this chapter not to draw back from their commitment to the faith they profess, but rather to be drawing near to God. So in face of the discouragement caused by persecution and opposition to their faith, he urges them to draw near. Now there's certainly a sanctifying influence in proper biblical encouragement. But there is also a sanctifying power in the fear of the living God. And that's what he's presenting to them here as he sets before them the fearful alternative to going on. The alternative to going on is going back. Back in chapter uh, 6, he urged them to leave behind the elementary things and to go on. Well, now he's warning them about the alternative to going on, which is going back. Because in the Christian life, there is no real standing still. Not really. If we ever stand still in the Christian life, it'll only ever be momentarily. We're either going on into deeper realms of of Christian obedience and into new riches of God's grace, or we are going back. We're drifting back from the things of God. It's one or the other. And because of that danger, he urges them here to live in the fear of God. That's why at the end of this passage, in verse 31, he says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of God. Of the living God. And I say this is a warning then about willful, deliberate, conscious turning your back on God. It says in verse 26, if we sin willfully, we might translate that, if we sin deliberately, if we deliberately go on sinning. Well, what's what's the writer referring to when he says that? And that is the real question here. Usually when people look at these warning passages in the epistle to the Hebrews, the question they ask is, who is the writer speaking about? Who is he referring to? And, and their concern then is to determine, is he talking about believers or unbelievers? Usually the question is, who? Who is he referring to? Can this possibly be speaking of believers when it talks about an awful judgment that falls on those who turn away in apostasy from the grace of God. Can it be that he's speaking to believers? That's the question people always seem to ask. Well, the answer is he's writing to Christians, to Hebrew Christians. And it's a simple folly to suggest that he's not speaking to Christians or that He's speaking to people who are very close to becoming Christians but turn away from a full commitment to the Lord Jesus 
or that he's writing about some kind of hypothetical situation that doesn't really relate to the people that he's writing to. It seems to me the Apostle, the, the, the New Testament never writes in a hypothetical way. Never, never, never just speaks into the air and puts possibilities in that sort of way to us. The Bible doesn't address hypothetical situations. It speaks directly to the people it addresses. And the point of the vagueness in the passage that leaves us unable to be sure who are these people? Are they believers or not? Were they ever truly regenerate? The point of that vagueness that's raised in our mind is, is that these, these warnings are deliberately vague so that we receive the warning and we take it to heart. He wants the sanctifying power of the fear of God to drive us to Jesus in a new way. That's the point of these warnings. And of course, none of this is a denial of the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, the eternal security of Christian believers. None of that is compromised by what the writer says here in this passage. And yet he's presenting to us a truly fearful prospect. And he's saying to us what Jesus said when he said, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. So rather than who, the question ought to be what. What is he referring to here? Not who, what. Because this does seem to raise the question of different kinds of categories of sins. Different kinds of sin. If we sin willfully, he says. Deliberately. Now there are two prominent elements in human sin. There's the element of waywardness or weakness, ignorance, folly. Earlier on in Hebrews, uh, the priest uh, is described as being able to be compassionate, to sympathize and to be compassionate toward the wayward and the ignorant. And there is in human sin that element of ignorance and folly, weakness, waywardness and so on. But there's also a second element in sin, which is deliberate and defiant premeditated rebellion against God, against his will, against his word. And we find that um, distinction then being drawn in scripture uh, between unintentional sins and deliberate sins. For example, in Leviticus 4, there's the provision made under the old covenant for dealing with unintentional sin. We, we saw the same, didn't we, in Numbers chapter 15. Uh, offerings made when unintentional sin was committed. Because even sin, when it is unintentional, incurs guilt. Just as in our country, if you say to a police officer, I'm sorry officer, I'm from Wales, I didn't realise you couldn't drive at 75 miles an hour on the motorway. Um, ignorance of the law is no defence, he'd say. But there was an atonement that was available for unintentional sins. But then in Numbers 15, verses 27 and following, we find a distinction drawn between unintentionally committed sins and presumptuous sins. Uh, some of our sins uh, are unintentional, some are Presumptuous, that's what he's saying. It's a reference to deliberate, premeditated rebellion against God and his word and his will. Now all of our sins have one or both of those elements present in them. Some of our sin has the greater part of ignorance and waywardness and folly in it rather than open rebellion. But there can be these presumptuous sins. We're all, we've all become very familiar, haven't we, this year with protests and the image of people standing with their fist raised like that. Well, it's interesting that the word translated in our 
English Bibles here, presumptuous, means sin with a high hand. Shaking a fist. Resisting authority. Protesting authority. Uh, that's, that's the word that's used here about this type of sin. Sin that is defiant against God. Uh, and the seriousness of high-handed sins or presumptuous sins in the Old Covenant is that there is no atonement for it. There's no offering that can be made that can turn away the anger of God from defiant, rebellious sins. And then the same distinction is drawn in the New Testament between sins of ignorance and defiant, uh, rebellious, deliberate sin. For example, you remember the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 1 speaks about the fact that he had once persecuted the church, which he said is the thing that made him the chief of sinners. But he said, I found mercy. How? Why? Because I committed it in ignorance and unbelief. And you remember how the Lord Jesus, as he's being crucified, as his hands are being prized open and men are driving nails through his hands into the cross, he prays, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So there are unintentional, we might say, sins, and then there are deliberate, defiant sins. Now, I want to be careful there and to be clear about, about this, so I'm going to ask you to really concentrate, to listen very clearly, so you have this matter clear in your own mind, uh, today, or I'm going to be inundated with phone calls after this sermon <laughs> asking me questions for the rest of the week. Firstly, even unintentional sin is deliberate. Those who crucified the Lord Jesus did that deliberately, didn't they? They thought about what they were going to do. They thought about it while they were doing it. And yet the Saviour prays, forgive them for they know not what they do. When Paul was uh, persecuting the church he was acting very deliberately he planned his campaign of persecution and he executed it very efficiently he knew just what he was doing and yet he could say he sinned ignorantly and in unbelief so that's the first thing the second thing is there is intentional sin and we can say if in intentional sin all high-handed sin is intentional but not all intentional sin is high-handed. I'll say that again. All high-handed sin is intentional, but not all intentional sin is high-handed. David's sin against Bathsheba and Uriah was intentional. He intended to do that. And yet he found forgiveness for those horrendous crimes. In the New Testament, intentional sins, sins committed in our daily struggle against the flesh, may find forgiveness. But high-handed sin, presumptuous sin, willful sin, a persistent attitude of continuing in direct rejection of the will and the word of God, defiantly continuing to resist and reject what we know to be God's will and God's word. That's what a presumptuous sin is. You can think of it like this. This, this book of Hebrews has a great deal to say to us about perseverance. Persevering in faith and obedience, going on with God, against all the pressures that confront the Christian and oppose them. Well, willful sin is perseverance twisted and contorted to the opposite end so that we persevere against God and we deliberately and consistently defy and rebel against him. So it's an attitude and a condition of the heart, you see. And we're not to be con concerned to identify it in terms of specific sins. That was a mistake made in the third century, for example. They, they thought of this sin as the sin of recanting faith under pressure. It was a time of severe 
prolonged persecution of the churches. And understandably, there were those who gave way under torture and those who gave way under the threat of death, and they renounced their faith in Christ. And some others thought there could be no forgiveness for that. It was an unpardonable sin. But what the New Testament is referring to here is not so much a specific sin, but a condition of the heart. It's what the Bible calls a hardened heart. It's an attitude or a spirit of utter, cold defiance of God, even when his word and his will is clearly understood. That's the point. Stubborn defiance of God. And here in Hebrews 10, 26, we're being warned about that kind of life. And you might say, but surely it's not possible for a Christian to get into that kind of condition. Well, he's not talking here about something that's unreal. He's speaking about an awful, fearful reality. Look at how he spells out the gravity of such a life in verse 29. Basically, it's a life that takes on the form of utter contempt for God. Notice what he says in verse 29. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? That, that is to do what the Lord Jesus describes in the parable of the the vine dressers that we read earlier, when the vineyard owner sends his son to the to the vineyard, and uh, the the vineyard, the vine dressers, the tenants deride and defy the owner by trampling his son underfoot. And then he goes on to talk of profaning the blood of the covenant by which we are sanctified. Uh, There in verse 29, he's talking about the sanctifying power of the blood of the covenant, because the blood of Jesus is shed not only for our salvation, but for our sanctification. There's a saving power in the blood of Jesus to cleanse us from all of our sins. Power in his blood. The blood of Jesus, by which we mean his death, has power also to change a life. And when we develop a consistent pattern of life, that is marked by resistance to God and rebellion against him, we're not only trampling underfoot the blood, uh, trampling underfoot the Son of God, but we're also profaning the blood of the covenant, he says, by which we are sanctified, treating it as if it were just common and unholy. When Jesus says it's holy, the third thing he mentions in verse 29 is, insulting the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of grace, the Holy Spirit through whom the grace of God is applied to the human heart to touch and transform our character, but to live in defiant rebellion against God is to so insult the Holy Spirit and to outrage and affront him that the Spirit of grace withdraws from us. So this is the gravity of the condition. And the terrible danger that he holds before us is the danger of having a hardened heart. Now when should we be most watchful against that condition? Well, it's when you begin to sense it happening to you. You deal with it then, because this is a recoverable condition. Uh, Like me, you might have known people who once, it seemed, walked with God. But they've drifted, they've fallen away from God, and they seem to have deliberately pursued a course away from God. And you've observed their heart, their heart becoming hard, and their life becomes cynical, and their souls seem to shrivel up. It's an awful thing to see. And the writer here uses such fearful language, doesn't he? But it's not to frighten us, you see. It's to warn us. Just as we would warn our children. If we saw our children wandering uh, into the path of danger, we would warn them, wouldn't we? 
If we loved them, we would warn them. Well, that's what God is doing here. Notice how he underlines the gravity of this by, by comparing this to the judgment that was meted out in Old Testament days on those who defied the law of Moses. Verse 28, he says, Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose he will be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? So he's arguing from the lesser sin to the greater sin, from the lesser judgment to the greater judgment. You break the law of Moses, that's a sin. You trample underfoot the Son of God? What happened to those who broke the law of Moses? Well, they died. They were put to death. What happens to those who trample underfoot the Son of God? Or something worse? He says in verse 30, uh, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. We rejoice in the security of the Lord's people. Nevertheless, the Lord will judge his people. And it is a fearful thing, he says, to fall into the hands of the living God. So often that text has been preached over the years as a text of the unconverted. But we see here, don't we, that its first application is to the Lord's people. Now the point of all this warning is not to lead us to discouragement. It's not to cause us to despair. The warnings that are given in Scripture are never given for that purpose. And we need to see that because it can be a real problem if we have a tender and a sensitive conscience, a tender and a sensitive soul. It can be a problem if we take up a verse like this and apply it to ourselves and to our own hearts and we begin to worry, well, have I committed this sin? Have I committed the unforgivable sin? Am I in this category? Of course, the point is that a person who worries that they've committed this sin couldn't have committed this sin because they've got a tender burdened heart and they're concerned about their standing before God these warnings as I say are not given to distress us or discourage us but rather to urge us on in the right way and they're doing it by showing us the gravity of the alternative are you tempted to turn back like the children of Israel in the wilderness you remember going to Moses and saying, why have you brought us up to this place? Was it not better for us in the land of Egypt? And they wanted to go back. The Apostle Paul, he kept that same, uh, same possibility in view, didn't he? Do you remember how he, he asked people to pray for him that he might persevere, lest having preached to others, I myself should be cast away? Paul? The Apostle Paul cast away? What could he possibly mean? Well, what he's doing is he's looking at the fearful op alternative of going on with God, which is to be cast away. Now, in verse 20, uh, sorry, 32 to 39, he, he follows on his previous pattern that we saw in, uh, for example, in chapter 6, where he follows the warning with an encouragement. And the encouragement comes from two sources. In chapter 6, you remember, he says, but we are persuaded of better things concerning you, brothers. That's, that's how he brings the encouragement there. But here he says in verse 32, but recall the former days. And he refers to their past experience. And then he goes on to, recall, uh, to refer to the future and what God is going to do in the future. So firstly, their past experience. Verse 32. Recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproach and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. Now, Scripture urges us like this to recall former days, and it does so for two reasons. One is to notice the contrast between what we once were without Christ and what we now are in Christ. 
wants us to see that. We're all familiar with how the Apostle Paul, well, he does this on number, a number of occasions. He would, for example, uh, recount and give a list of the debauchery of the ancient world. And he would then say, and such were some of you. But you are now washed and justified and sanctified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You, you were like that. Now you're like this. That's how he refers to the past in relation to ourselves. Think about what you once were. Think of how you once had no desire for God, no desire for holiness and righteousness. But you're not like that now. So there's that kind of contrast set up. That's how the New Testament refers to the past in relation to us. And it's intended to encourage us. It's not there to make you feel proud. Well, look at what I am now. Uh, it's not there to puff you up, but to remind you of how the grace of God has been at work in you. God being gracious. The second reason to recall the past is to note the evidence of grace at work in our lives. You were like that. But grace has come. There's been a new beginning. There's a new life. It's slightly different here in Hebrews 10, isn't it? Because the past he re reveals is not their non-Christian past, but their Christian past. Recall the former days in which after you were illuminated... After they became Christians, they endured a great struggle with suffering, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulation, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. So he's talking about their Christian past, and he, he highlights for them three hallmarks of their Christian life. The first is endurance. That was their continuing need, but it also had marked their early life. Recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with suffering. You endured, he says. One of the hallmarks of God's grace is, is a willingness to suffer for Jesus' sake. Now look to the past, he says. Didn't God prove himself at that time? When, when you endured, when you went through that experience that was so awful, and yet you got through it, didn't God keep you through that? How did you bear all that? How could you stand all that? Well, it was Jesus enabling you to endure, he says. And then he mentions their compassion. Verse 34, you had compassion on me in my chains. That's a wonderful mark of grace. Compassion. A selfless concern for others who are in trouble. What made you like that, he says? Well, it was Jesus at work in you with his grace. And then he mentions a third thing, which I'll call heavenly mindedness. Verse 34. Uh, you joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. That's a wonderful mark of grace. The joyful uh, acceptance of the plundering of their, their property, of their goods, of their homes, which was a common experience for them. It's a wonderful uh, thing, a wonderful thing when God gives us a detachment to our earthly possessions so that we can hold everything with a, a very loose grasp. We can, we can do that, you see, if it's not our treasure. I don't mean that we don't love and that we don't appreciate our homes and our possessions. Of course we do. We love the comfort that God has given to us and brought into our lives. We enjoy the comfort and we should enjoy those things. It's not a sign of Christian grace to repudiate the comforts that God has given to us and to refuse to enjoy them. Some people can be like that, but it's very foolish. God has given us all things richly to enjoy. But these things are not our treasure. That's the point. And we don't live for these things. So we can suffer the loss of these things. Our treasure is in heaven, where moth and rust doth not corrupt, and where thieves do not break in and steal. So he holds before them the evidence of the work of grace 
in their lives. And, and sometimes we need that kind of evidence and the encouragement that it brings to us. It's Jesus, he says, who has taught you to more highly value the eternal world than the transient things and treasures of this world. And then he says, uh, very quickly, the, the same God who brought you through past trials will bring you through these present trials and he'll bring you all the way to glory. So he says, verse 35, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Don't throw away your confidence in God, he's saying to them. Don't exchange treasure, real treasure, for dust. Don't give up diamonds for little stones. Don't throw away your confidence in God. Recall the past, what God has done in you and how he has brought you to this point. And reckon on God for the future. Verse 36, he says, You have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now, if, now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. You need to persevere, he says. Persevere in light of the fact that God is in control. Don't imagine for one moment that the future is uncertain and that the future is unknowable. That's the world's way of thinking. For yet a little while... And he who is coming will come and will not tarry. So don't shrink back. Live by faith. Hold fast. Jesus is coming. The great question of history is settled. He who is coming will come. Don't shrink back. Because to shrink back is to shrink back from glory. But can we hold on? How can we hold on? Well, that's what chapter 11 is all about. Faith is the key, he says. And so in chapter 11, he summons witness after witness from the whole of Bible history to us. By faith, Abel. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Moses. And on and on he goes through that chapter to show us how these people persevered by faith. Faith in their God and ours. That's how to persevere confidently, living by faith in this utterly trustworthy God. Well, the Lord bless his word to us. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for the power of your word. We thank you that it can grip and hold and shape our lives by the power of your Holy Spirit. It can transform us. And we pray for that transforming work that has begun in us that it might continue. We ask that by your power, by your grace, your spirit and your word, we would be more closely conformed to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. That you would enable us to persevere in the face of opposition, and even should it come, open perse persecution for us. That we would see our treasure is in heaven, and that we would live with that kind of heavenly mindedness. Grant us this grace and mercy as we ask it in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.